Welcome to Tomorrow's Tech Today, bringing you the latest in technology, talent, and transformational change. With me, your host, Professor Sally Eaves. Hi, everyone, and a very warm welcome to this Cybersecurity Awareness Month special feature. I'm delighted to be joined by Giovanni Vigner, who is head of the NSBU Threat Analysis Unit at VMware. Today, we're discussing, well, I'd call it really the chameleon, if you will, of cybersecurity threats today. It's Emotet. It really is one of the most evasive and destructive malware delivery systems to ever be deployed. And it uses many different techniques to maximize its infection rate and to reinvent itself, if you will, against growing cybersecurity defenses. So that ability to understand better and to get ahead at such a resilient risk has never mattered more. To do that, VMware have just released a very detailed report with all the latest insights. So without further ado, I'd love to welcome Giovanni to Tomorrow's Tech Today. It's great to have you here. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Oh, my absolute pleasure. And I always have this as a bit of a starting point. I always think it's nice to get to know you, you know, the person behind the tech, if you will. So I wonder if you could share a bit more about your journey to your current role at VMware and maybe a ma- moment that mattered, like a milestone moment along the way. Sure. Uh, so I I have worn many hats in my life. So I'm a professor of computer science at the University of California, Santa Barbara. Uh, and I also started a company called Last Line. I actually have a t-shirt for it. Um, And Last Line was acquired by VMware in 2020. And so as part of that acquisition, I was the CTO at uh, Last Line and I became the senior director of threat intelligence at the NSBU unit within VMware. And so my, uh, my job at VMware is really to do threat research. So understanding what the threats are, and sort of like finding new ways to detect and pr- detect the threats and protect our customers. Fantastic. I love that. I also love the way that you're bringing you know, education, awareness, research alongside practical application of, of technology protection as well. So I think that's so important. It bridges a lot of gaps. And I'll definitely come back to some of your education work a bit later as well. Shared interest there. So I'd love to highlight some of what you're doing for community support as well. I think it's brilliant. But back to your main role, so around the threat analysis unit at VMware, I wonder if you could explore a little bit more exactly what you do, you know, what types of attacks that you're looking at at the moment, and some of the data, tools, and techniques and technologies that are involved in supporting that. Sure. Uh, so uh, threat intelligence means understanding the threat landscape. So the basic idea there is that you are constantly under attack, and by a plethora of you know, cyber criminals, and all cyber criminals come at you in different ways. Um, Some of them, you know, have different goals. For example, they might be interested in your information, or they might be interested in your infrastructure to mine cryptocurrencies, or might be interested in infecting you with ransomware so they can ask you for money in exchange for ways to decrypt your data. So understanding all these, what we call in the, in the business, we call it toxic, tactics, techniques, and procedures, or TTPs, is an important part of getting ready before you are attacked. And in a way, threat intelligence is information about the adversary, but also a way to inform your security mechanisms, policies, and so on and so forth. And so that's what we do. We look out, we find out what's happening in the world in terms of cybercrime, and then we try to help the community at large, but also, of course, VMware in developing uh, mechanisms that can protect our customers. Fantastic. I love that. I think it's so important in, in kind of moving beyond being reactive to some of these threats to getting more and more proactive. Exactly. Um, and I think you mentioned there some of the evolution that's happening, you know, evolution in goals, you know, the aims of some of these attacks, but also the different methods that come to play as well. You know, other things I've certainly seen is, you know, the, the bad guys coming together, you know, the rise of bad actor collaboration 
and just overall when you look at the, the marketplace the cyber crime economy um if you will as well the cost of entry the starting point has got lower and lower you know i read something recently you could buy a ransomware kit for around 66 dollars, something like that so it's almost you know a cup of coffee in a cafe once a day kind of yes. do that for a few days effectively you can buy something like that so so many vectors of change happening I wondered from your point of view and your depth of experience here, what are you seeing as the greatest area of evolution or innovation really in security threats at the moment? Yeah, I, I would say that uh, uh, once upon a time, many, many years ago, uh, we looked at cyber criminals at this, you know, short buckling uh, criminals that would go and have their, uh, their, you know, attack tools. And they were very, um, very uh, focused on one single things. Uh, and But instead, the evolution is that cybercrime has become an ecosystem. So there are different um, actors or different groups that provide different things. And in fact, uh, ransomware as a service, you were mentioning, you know, being able to go on the dark market and, and buying a particular tool. There are also a situation in which you can be an affiliate which means that you are responsible, for example, to break into a particular network, but then you leave all the handling of our ransomware, uh, of the, the uh, discussion about the ransom itself to a different actor. So there are all these different groups that uh, develop the software, distribute the software, drop the software, manage the software. And so this new ecosystem, it's something that makes it much harder to fight a specific threat because the threat is not just one thing. The threat is a combination of actors that come at you with different roles, different angles. And so to disrupt it in a way, you have to disrupt it all because the since it's kind of a hydra with multiple heads, once you cut one, another head, you know, just pops up to take the place of the one you removed. So this is uh, how I think the landscape has evolved in the past, you know, 10 years or so. And that made it uh, much harder to fight cybercrime. So I think the visualizations you were you were picturing there, they were running through my head as you were talking there. You really brought that to life. Great examples and analogies there. And it really brings to the fore that complexity, you know, the, the scale, the scope, the sophistication of change, the different vectors of change, and all those multiple roles in the cyber crime, you know, economy, if you will, or ecosystem really brings that to life. And it brings me on to another area as well about threats that last. You know, some threats become truly persistent. Um, and one of those is Emotet, which is my, probably, I think, the most evasive and destructive um, malware delivery system probably we've ever encountered from a global perspective as well. Why has that one um, come to the surface again? Why has it done so much damage and you know, why is it continuing to do that? So Emotet is, is really, uh, I would say, a great, uh, great for the bad guys delivery system. Uh, it has, uh, throughout the years, I mean, many years since, I think, 2014, has been able to deliver anything from remote access tool to ransomware to all sorts of threats. Um, and so it's exactly one of those you know, actors in the ecosystem that has been very successful. Uh, the success has been determined by having uh, an infrastructure that is very resilient to take down. Actually, uh, there was a pretty recent uh, takedown operation that uh, stopped the Emotet gang for a little bit, but they came back and they came back, uh, funny enough, brought, they were brought back by another gang that started, you know, missing, uh, I guess, uh, the Emotet guys and say, hey, we want you back in the mix. And they uh, started distributing Emotet again. And since then, the Emotet gang is fundamentally back, uh, bringing all sorts of ransomware and threats. Uh, so it, it is a very uh, long lasting gang that has a very sophisticated way of changing their TTPs, so their tactics, techniques, and procedure to stay afloat and prevent detection uh, at a large scale. 
really interesting. I, I've got another visual in my head now as you're talking, like chameleon, you know, that constant evolution and changing what you look like type, type of thing. I think that's really, really interesting one. And I think it couldn't be more timely, the new research that you've put together that's coming out um, shortly. So brand new research, really exploring this particular attack vector and helping organizations, you know, of any size really better understand this risk and how to better defend yourself as well. Please can you share a little bit more about how that analysis was undertaken and some of the key insights that report's bringing to the fore? Absolutely. Uh, so as part of our research, we use the data that we collect from uh, our customers. So we have this kind of data lake where we get telemetry for our customer that we analyze to identify possible attacks. And we saw these spikes of amateur infections and we decided, hey, we have to look deeper into this and understand this threat in more depth. Um, and so we said, how can we slice and dice it because we're scientists after all. And so we want to really understand the inner working of, of this particular threat. So the first thing that we did is like uh, to try to understand how the infection happens. So typically emotet arrives by email with an attachment with a document, but what happens? The document gets open and starts invoking, for example, a PowerShell script that downloads a component through a URL and then executes it with another shell script and so on and so forth. And so we started looking at these programs, calling other programs during the infection process, trying to characterize them. And, and they actually, you know, you can see them as a tree. So program one, maybe execute one program and then another program, this program execute other program. And we find a way to look at how these three can be similar to each other. So, because once you characterize like a similarity, you can group them together. And by clustering them together, we were able to actually see how the threat evolved in its way to infect uh, people. And we could see waves, understand them better, and also give people uh, or other you know, uh, scientists information on how to detect these evolving threats, the chameleon that you were referring to. And, and we did the same also with their infrastructure, monitoring how this, this uh, component talked to their uh, command and control or C2 uh, and how they download new components as they evolve through time. And so our analysis was on how the infrastructure evolves, how the new component uh, have been updated throughout time, again, to provide to uh, uh, the community at large some information on this ever-evolving threat. Fantastic. I love the granularity of detail there. I can, could see that tree unpacking itself, really, that trajectory of the evolution of that threat over time and all the different pathways it can take in that evolution. So really fascinating. And, and given your, your expertise in this area, what are you recommending? You know, some kind of top level highlights really, you know, across technology or program or education or process perspective, because obviously it all comes together from a holistic support for cybersecurity. But have you got any top recommendations that organizations can look at now to help better protect against this threat? Uh, absolutely. I, I think that an important piece of the puzzle is mail. I mean, uh, Emotet is, you know, coming mostly through links and attachments in emails. And therefore, uh, having good email security solutions and education of the users is fundamental. There is so much that can be done just by, you know, uh, educating the customers, the users, uh, the, uh, the students uh, at a university not to click on anything that appears in a send, in an email inbox. Uh, so I think that would go a long way. Uh, of course, also having investing in security. You know, it could be protection of your computer, could be the network, uh, could be other ways that will uh, sort of mitigate the post-infection damage. Because if you have, you know, for example, protection within your network, maybe you get infected by Amotet, but the infection cannot spread to your own network. So all these mechanisms contribute to the overall security, but definitely training the users not to click on everything they see immediately would be would go a long way 
Absolutely. It's always incredible, isn't it? When you look at some of the research around cybersecurity, and I, I do some work particularly with a particular cybersecurity think tank, so much of the risk can be reduced through relatively simple hygiene factors and education. It's so, so true. It's that point about education awareness, that shared responsibility culture around cybersecurity. It's got to be right up there as, as part of that support. So I, I couldn't agree more strongly. Fantastic to hear you kind of showcasing that. And I'd love to talk a little bit more as well about VMware specifically and what you're doing to address Emotet and, and other malware strains as well. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so at VMware, we have uh, a number of security solutions. I work with NSX, so uh, NSX focuses on network virtualization, and we have solutions to detect emotets, uh, implants, uh, to detect emotets, communication to the uh, to the command and control. So we have ways to uh, compartmentalize the network so that emotets infection cannot spread to the whole network. So. Uh, we provide a number of security mechanisms within the network intrinsically, but also uh, at, the, at the host level to protect our customer from uh, this threat. Uh, of course, research is, is important. So being able to you know, be aware of the threats out there is a, a key part. The Threat Analysis Unit, TAU at VMware, is one of the lead groups in threat intelligence. So that's our job. We, we pass our, uh, our time looking at what could hit our customers and in general, the public, and finding ways to block those threats before they hit users and customers. I love that because it really is looking at the full life cycle of a security or a cybersecurity threat right from that um, research stage. Um, all the way through to, you know, helping prevent attacks in the first place, but that containment and addressing it if it actually does. So I love the fact you're really looking at it from that end to end full life cycle approach. It's so, so important. And it really helps that move for organizations really of any size to get far more active and proactive around their security posture. So brilliant stuff. I love that. And I'm going to come back to something I kind of cited a little bit earlier on in a way about these vectors of change that we're seeing and the variety of them and the sophistication of them. Um, from your take and the research you're doing to date, where do you think the next major threat might come from? And what would you advise, given that, to help future-proof it against it right now? That's a great question. And, you know, I, I would need a big crystal ball for that. Uh, I would say um, I, I would say that, you know, the, uh, the ability to uh, reduce your exposure in general to threats is key. So uh, we, we still have a, a very poor understanding of our networks and how they, the internal part relate to each other. And I think that a key aspect that we have to work more on is to um, monitor our networks, see how the different parts talk to each other and put in place mechanisms, say, this front end never needs to talk to the administrative database of our HR department. Uh, right now, very few companies have the sophistication necessary to identify the sub parts of the network and be able to compartmentalize the internal network so that the breach of your, you know, internet facing website does not affect your HR administrative function. It seems like an obvious thing, but it, it is so rare to see companies doing that. And I think that is, in a way, the best future proofing because you can detect threats, you can block threats, but you cannot ever eliminate them because, you know, the, the, the difference between security and other fields is that your adversary is a human being with creativities, with uh, ideas with uh, new ways to bypass uh, all kind of protections. So instead of building, you know, a, a more sophisticated trap, which or I should say instead, in addition to, you also need to uh, compartmentalize your network to make sure that a problem in one side of the network doesn't become a problem in the whole network. So important. It's interesting. I've just done a, a, a takeaway, like a key keynote speech. I was just doing takeaways before I came on this podcast. I was talking about sustainability in tech. 
I was talking about the ability to be modular and modular doesn't design so that you can reduce, for example, the number of batteries you need and the, and the charging components. And it makes it easier to, to repurpose and replace a part and increase the end of life. Um, and it kind of relates in a funny sort of way to what you were saying there about that compartmentalization um, of the network as well, seeing all those different entities, knowing exactly what's there and that granular visibility um, to protect against these risks. As you say, they're always be coming through, but it's what you can do to reduce the risk and reduce that threat area of, of, around your estate. So I love that example. So it threw me into what, what I was talking about this afternoon as well from a different perspective. But I think that compartmentalization and modularity around tech are two really interesting areas at the moment. And other ones, I'm hearing it again and again, it's visibility that you mentioned there, it's integration, um, and also it's reducing complexity overall as well. You know, things like tool sprawl is coming up a lot in conversations I'm having at the moment. So I love the fact that you've highlighted on a really practical area that every organization can start looking at today. Brilliant stuff, thank you. And I'd love to dovetail now slightly, if I may, going back right to your introduction when you were talking about some of your other roles that you do, particularly in education. I've been looking at this in some detail because I love this. It's a shared passion. Um, so you do so much work, obviously, around research, but also around education and awareness, one of which being the International Capture the Flag competition, which I think is brilliant. So one of the largest defence attack um, hacking competitions in the world. Um, and literally three weeks ago, I was in, in Zurich. So there's a competition there called Hack Zurich. I was one of the mentors and judges. And that was an amazing event. And that was looking at kind of using code for good with a range of different challenges. So I'd love we could shine a light on your work in that area too, because I, I see firsthand with students just what a difference it can make. Can you share more about some of the work you're doing there today and also how people might be able to get involved? Absolutely. Uh, uh, okay, I would say capture the flag and security exercise in general are a great way to get involved in cybersecurity uh, because they're fun and it's a gamification of something that could seem dry and, and boring to some, uh, never to me, but uh, the, it, when you gamify immediately, it becomes uh, a team building exercise. Uh, you immediately want to learn more about all these different aspects of cybersecurity. Uh, so I've been organizing this ICTF uh, at UCSB since 2003. So now we're approaching 20 years of, of this competition. And, and it's very simple. It, you, you create kind of virtualized host with a bunch of vulnerabilities. You gave it to all the participants so everybody has the same thing. So they have to look into their own copy find the vulnerabilities and use that knowledge to exploit the hosts of the other uh, teams and capture the flag, which is a, like a string of text that changes all the time. So they can prove that they actually exploited uh, that particular service and they make points and the one with most points get bragging rights, wins and all that good stuff. The important thing is that this forces you to uh, learn new things because it might be the case that you are for example, analyzing Rust code, and you never saw Rust as a programming language, and you're like, oh my God, Rust, I have to learn. So you start looking at how Rust works, and in the process of trying to find the vulnerability, you learn so much about things that you would never look at otherwise. And so I think that these are very easy to get into, so it's great accessibility. And uh, the value that you can extract from these experiences is enormous. And so I really advocate uh, for CTF to educate this cyber workforce. I love it. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. The passion you see at this, they're amazing. I, I, I couldn't, I couldn't you know, agree more strongly. Get involved in any opportunities like this. They're amazing, as you're saying, for that discipline development and learning new skills and new languages, but equally around the co-creativity. The teamwork is amazing. You always see you know, teams helping each other out, even if they're meant to be in competition. It's never like that. It's such an amazing atmosphere. So, And as you were describing there as well, it's learning by doing, which I think is always the best way to do it. It's so hands-on. So absolutely, yes. And I'll be sharing all the details about what you do there, because and hopefully more and more people will get involved, because I just think it's a great opportunity. And congratulations on that 20 years as well. Awesome. Thank and you. I have one final question, and you've teed me up perfectly for what I was going to ask about this, but I have a series called 365, and I called it that because it's about placing a spotlight on inclusion and diversity in its broader sense in the tech industry. And rather than you know, a particular focus day, although they're great and really important, the 365 is to emphasize this is something to consider you know, every single day of the year. We need to embed it by design, basically. So 
you know, for people at the moment who may be considering security and cybersecurity as a career, and it might be at school at the moment, in primary and secondary, or university, or an older adult who might be looking to reskill or upskill right now. What would your kind of top recommendation or two be about how to move into cybersecurity as a career and why you might want to do so? And obviously, you set it up brilliantly with with the hackathon type approach as one route of entry. So that's obviously a brilliant one. But anything else you would love to share, I'm sure, would be really valuable. Absolutely. Uh, uh, fortunately, uh, in in cybersecurity, there are so many resources online, and they're free, and there are courses. There are tutorials and things that people can access. However, I mean, the, if you really are serious about cybersecurity, I would consider uh, going to a computer science or a computer engineering degree because having those foundations, especially in coding, in developing tools, is a, a, an absolute key aspect of uh, stepping up your security game. Because using tools, of course, is the first step, but developing tools, understanding how to compose to, to get tools together to achieve even more complex uh, security uh, goals is really important. And sincerely, uh, being having a degree in computer science or computer engineering uh, would go a long way. Uh, in terms of becoming a security expert, I would say, do competition, do capture the flag, do hacking challenges, get there and find your community. There are so many communities in this space that just, you know, want to uh, have communication, team building and interactions. And I, I must say, I've seen, I've been in this community for, I would say, you know, now uh, 25 years at least. And it has, improve dramatically in terms of diversity and inclusion. Uh, this community was once very male oriented and, you know, uh, building barriers in very in various ways. And those barriers are coming down and they become a lot more inclusive. Uh, I know uh, at, at colleges and universities were working as hard as possible to make uh, the whole environment more positive, inclusive and diverse. Uh, there's still quite a bit of work that needs to be done, but uh, we we are doing the work. Fantastic. I love that. What a positive way to end it. I couldn't agree more. And that that kind of slogan you mentioned there, there in many ways about find your community. I couldn't agree more strongly. And there's so much out there. Also, social media communities as well. A lot of people who've got shared, you know, shared experiences will really openly share online. And it can be a great springboard to mentoring opportunities and things like that as well. Certainly something I've done firsthand. So absolutely, there's so much support out there. And as you mentioned as well, so much now is free to access too. So I would say if you see something, press that button, click to commit and go for it. And, you know, we've talked about today the rate of change in cybersecurity. What a fascinating place to be for a career, because it is, as by definition, what we've seen today with Epitet and some of the other threats we've discussed today it's always changing there's so much evolution so being involved in that and you know joining the good guys and coming together against that threat what a great place to be always changing always learning thank you Giovanni honestly it's been a real pleasure speaking to you today thank you for having me I really enjoyed it thank you so much and thank you all for listening and watching too and all the examples we've shared today we'll be putting those in the show notes and please do get involved thank you all Thanks for listening to this episode of Tomorrow's Tech Today. If you enjoy what we're doing, please subscribe to us and leave a review. It really means a lot. You can also follow us on Twitter and Instagram and see more behind the scenes video footage on YouTube. Thanks for listening.